Good morning. Good morning. And I'm sorry that I'm running just a minute or two late. That's certainly not uh, my habit, but it does happen. Um, so uh, today is going to be very relaxed, very easygoing. This is just a uh, time for um, you to get to know me and for me to get to know you. So if you have not already uh, filled out the icebreaker on the, um, on the course website on e-learning, please do that now while I'm sort of telling you about me, right? And, um, and we'll, uh, and then, then at the end, we're going to do a uh, chance where you guys can, um, where I'm going to answer the questions that you guys have submitted. Um, so, because one of the things that I ask you in that icebreaker is to ask any question that you want, as long as it's not, how do I get an A in this class or some variation on that? Um, and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, so, um, so like I said yesterday in the lecture, I'm a political scientist, right? So um, what I do in terms of research and scholarship is I study courts as political institutions. Um, so, you know, law professors normally do research that sort of goes out into uh, trying to dig into um, what courts do, right? So um, how do courts decide torts cases or property cases or uh, criminal cases, right? My research asks the question, why do courts decide cases the way they do? And so um, I'm asking questions that are related to what are the things that affect the judge's decision making that the judges may not even be aware are going on. So for example, um, there's a lot of research in a lot of different contexts that suggests that judges are to some extent under certain circumstances deciding cases based on their political preferences. And in, for law professors, that's a story that makes zero sense because judges are supposed to decide cases based on the law and the facts. And judges very frequently say things like, well, you know, you don't like the result of every case that you decide, but you decide them the way the law commands and the political scientists are here to tell you that that is bollocks. Um, the, uh, the judges absolutely decide cases based on their preferences um, under certain circumstances in some cases. And that, that finding has held true um, sort of across every context that it's been, that it's been examined. Right, so that's that's what I do. Okay, um, I spend a lot of time learning statistics because the work that I do requires um, statistical analyses of thousands of cases in order to to examine what we're doing. Um, so that's me as a researcher. Um, I don't know that that's really all that interesting, um, but uh, if you're interested, that's me as a researcher, me as a teacher. Okay, so here's the kind of teacher that I am. I believe that the purpose of education is to enable students to build a better world which means that you're going to need to learn sort of the state of the world as it is, right? So we're going to spend a lot of time in this class figuring out how to analyze 
torts cases, since this is a torts class, under existing doctrine. We're also going to spend some time talking about alternative approaches, right? Different ways to approach tort liability um, or the social ills that tort liability solves um, in, an, in a way that allows you to examine them comparatively and to ask, what's the better method here? So that when you go out into the world and you become judges and ministers and attorneys general, you can build a better system if you think it's warranted, right? At the end of this, you may go, well, the current system is the best of all possible systems and that's a legitimate conclusion to reach, okay? Um, but that's what I want at the end of the class is for you to feel like you not only understand the system, that the society that we have, the system that's in place, but that you understand the alternatives and that you're able to criticize and, uh, and build a better system. So in terms of me as an examiner, right? So you're going to turn in work in this class and I'm going to um, assess you with it. Um, boy, that's just the absolute worst part of being a professor. Um, and it's not, it's not the worst because like students are bad or students aren't, aren't doing good work. It's the worst because the last thing that I think I'm qualified to do is pass judgment on you. But that's the requirement. That's what I have to do. And so, okay. Here we are, passing judgment. Um, but that doesn't mean that I can't do things to take into account the fact that, you know, we're all struggling, right? We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're all, you know, waiting and hoping for the jab to let us resume normal life, um, having lost, you know, a year, a year and a half. And there's nothing that says that I can't examine you in a way that acknowledges those difficulties and that, that uh, those problems and those obstacles. Um, so that's what I try to do. Uh, as I, I put it to uh, my students last semester, right? This is a system, and I don't just mean like the university, I mean well, the legal profession, I mean late stage capitalism, I mean the whole world, right? This is a system that is designed to break you. And in those kinds of worlds, being kind to one another is the most radical act you can undertake. And so that transitions very nicely into what I expect from you on the day-to-day -day basis as a, uh, as a student. The first and most important thing that I expect from you is that you be kind. Most especially to one another, it would be nice if you were kind to me as well, but you know, that's, that's less important. Um, so that's the first and most important thing. The second thing that I want from you is to be prepared. So come to class, have done the reading, um, have reviewed the worksheet. You know, when you come to the tutorials, have the question in mind, have spent some time thinking about it, maybe do a little bit of research. I'm not going to sort of push you guys to, uh, to go too far 
out on your own. Um, but that's, you know, that's what I mean when I say be prepared. <clears throat> um, the third thing that I want that I want from you as students is for you to communicate. Okay. If you are having trouble, right? If you can't access a resource, if you are um, having a, a frustrating time with the material, I want to hear about it because I can't help you if I don't know what's going on. If you're having problems at home, right? If you're having health problems, you don't have to tell me anything, but you are free to tell me everything, okay? So that's, those are the three things that I really want from you. Be kind, be prepared, be communicative, okay? Um, so what questions do you have about this? This is not your, uh, your, your AMA, that's later. What questions do you have about this? About what I've said so far, anything? I don't have a question, um, but um, I think what you've said is clear to me. Okay, great. Okay, now um, at this point, there's a couple of things that, that we can do. The first one is, um, is there anyone who is confused about the question in the icebreaker about walk-up music? If you're if you're confused and you, you've you never heard of that, I have a video to, to play for you guys. Um, but if everybody understands it, we'll just skip that. So if you're, if you don't understand it, sing out and we'll, uh, we'll play the video for you. Go ahead, Sally. I'll appreciate the video, thank you. I'm sorry, I, you're really far from your microphone. Let me turn up my... I said I will appreciate the video. Okay. All right, well, then we'll play the video. So give me one second. All right. The game of baseball is full of personality, whether it's the players, the coaches, or even the fans. Can you guys hear? the audio from the video? Uh, Not I, anymore. Okay, but you could when it was playing. At first, yeah, and then it stopped. Okay, let me, let me try this again because I think I messed something up. Give me one second. All right, let's try it again. personality. Whether it's the players, the coaches, or even the fans, it's the unique people and situations that make this game special. Certainly, Florida State baseball is no exception. One of the best ways for players to let their personalities shine through is through walkout music. As each Seminole walks up to the batter's box, a song of the players choosing plays over the loudspeakers at Dickhauser Stadium. Whether it's an old standard, or something more recent, it's a symbol that brings personality to each at bat. This one's something that's gonna relax you. I know some guys are a little different. Some guys like to get pumped up. I like a song that when I hear, I'm like, you know, it's just it's not nice. They got a nice little groove to it. You know, you can you can listen to it in your head. You kind of get a little rhythm going. It depends on what mood you're in. I feel like um, usually I like to get in the box pretty relaxed. Uh, I mean, obviously that's why I draw the smiley face in the box before I get up there to hit. It gives me something to bop to when I'm going up to the plate. Uh, it has to be something that, that that would get me moving, and uh, you, I mean, people can't really tell, but when I walk to the plate, I'm kind of kind of bobbing my head. And it's not just one style. 
All sorts of music plays throughout the Florida State lineup. You've got your hard rock. And of course, some mainstream pop music. But nothing, and I mean nothing, will compare to what fans hear when Jace Boyd walks to the plate. said it's only Jace, only Jace, you know, uh, Jace, Jace is a guy that can get away with a lot of stuff just because of how he is, you know, he's a you know, nice, calm, relaxed kid, but at times he can be a little weird, so party in the USA, I guess, matches him pretty good. Jace is one of the only guys that ever, that could probably pull that off, uh, a Miley Cyrus song, and people love him for it, and, and he does, man, he, he loves it. it, it's fun, we all love it, and, and the fans get to out of it. Whenever it came out, I really just, I like the song, it, it just kind of made me made me happy. I guess, you, I, mean, I mean, people have those songs that you listen to over and over again, and I could listen to that song all day. That's just who Jace Boyd is. Nothing gets him rattled. He could be 5 for 5, or over 5 at the plate on any given day, and his personality would just stay the same. See, it would be one thing if Boyd were hitting 250 on the season, but he's a 400 hitter and leads the league in RBI. Usually Jace is probably three for four or four for five against them that game, so they don't really say anything other than that kid can really hit. And we're usually like, yeah, that's Jace. It has to to some degree, but at the same time they have to say, wow. I mean, that, it, it takes a little a little bit of, you know what, to, to play that song for your walkout, hopefully, or, or they may just think I'm a big dork. Either one is, is fine with me. So next time you're in Hauser Stadium, make sure you listen to the music. There's meaning behind each song, and just another part of what makes Florida State baseball so special. I'm Scott Coder reporting for Seminoles.com. Okay. So, so this is what we mean when we when we refer to walk-up music, right? So this is a thing that is particular to uh, baseball in the United States, where when a player comes up to bat. Uh, the stadium announce at when he, when a home player comes up to bat, the stadium announce announcement system will play music to help pump them up and sort of pump up the crowd. So, if this was you, what would your walk up music be? Right? What would the thing be? What would the song be that really gets you going? That that helps you think through it. So that's what that question is asking on the icebreaker, and it's really. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. It's whatever speaks to you. So, for example, my uh, mine is here. I'll I'll pull it up and and play it for you. Um, so let's see. Here we go. Yeah. So. So this one's mine. And it's go boys go, they'll time your every breath. And every day are in this place, your two days nearer death. But you go. Well, I process man and boy, and I'm telling you no lie. I work and breathe among the fumes that trail across the sky. There's thunder all around me and there's poison in the air. There's a lousy smell that smacks of hell and dust all in the hair. So you can see, you know, sort of how this works and how this is a something that's intended to express an aspect of your personality. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the, the, the only thing that, you know, sort of, you need to know to fill out the icebreaker. Um, with that, I'm ready to take your questions. So um, what I will do is I will just um, go through uh, your responses on this, on the survey here on e-learning and um, and answer the questions for those of you who are here. So let me pull those up and we'll, okay. 
and I don't, well, I'm, well, I'm kind of an idiot because uh, you guys didn't, I didn't ask for your names. Okay, well, then uh, let's do this a different way and I will call on you. Um, you're welcome to use the chat or to unmute uh, as you choose, but I'm going to call on folks and I'm really just gonna go down, uh, go down the grid here in my uh, screen here, um, starting at the, at the bottom right. So Akeem, you're, you're all the way at the bottom right on my screen. So you, you get called on first. You, you can ask any one question that is not, how do I get an A in this course? And I will answer it. Are you sure? Because this is your one chance. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Akeem. I can't hear you. Think of one. Um, on you, I let you know, sir. Okay. All right. Well, then next up is uh, Alyssa. Alyssa Hill. So you're you're up. What is your your one question? My question was, what compelled you to do law? Um, nothing compelled me to do law. I, I grew up in a democracy, so I could I could pursue any profession I, I wanted. But that's not what you're asking, all right? <laughs> what you're actually asking is, what brought me to law? Okay, and, and here's the answer, right? So I graduated from college in, uh, you know, a number of years ago. Uh, and I thought I was going to go into the foreign service, that I was going to become a diplomat. Um, and the American Foreign Service uh, is a professionalized civil service with an exam-based hiring process. Um, and I didn't score well enough on the exam to get hired. Uh, really? just that simple. So I uh, was sort of left going, I'm not sure what I want to do. I uh, spent some time working in politics, working on political campaigns, and I thought that was a really great job. I really liked that. Um, but what I found was that uh, the top level campaign staffers all had law degrees. Right? They had all gone to law school. And so I thought, okay, this seems to be the next step for me is, is going to law school and then going back on the campaign trail. And I went to law school and uh, never, I've not worked on a campaign since. So, so that's the answer of how I, I got into law um, is that I thought I wanted to do something else. And then um law became this puzzle that was a chance for me to work out. So, and that's sort of where I've stayed since then. Okay. So, Renisha, or is it Renesha? Uh, you're, well, however it's pronounced, and please correct me, please tell me how it's pronounced. You're next. It's pronounced Renisha, you were correct the first thing. Okay. And my question was, my question was, um, what tips would you give to the class on how to complete the readings given? Okay, so uh, reading is actually something that's really, like, it's hard to teach well. Um, but I, I'm actually going to post something on the uh, e-learning site, but there's no reason for me not to put it in the chat for you guys. Um, so this is, here we go. So this is a friend of mine um, named Raul Pacheco Vega, and he uh, is sort of really dedicated to providing some public resources for uh, his students and for his colleagues and for their students. And so um, 
he's got an entire uh, page on his website that is dedicated to um, blog posts that he's written to help undergraduates understand how to read. Um, and there's a whole series of them, uh, one, two, three, uh, four of them, in fact. Um, and that is uh, where he, where, where I would point you in terms of getting your first uh, feet wet in terms of understanding like how to complete the readings, okay? So, uh, um, and Phoebe, Anna, Anna Phoebe, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you are, you are next. And again, any, any, this, this goes for any of you, if I've mispronounced your name, please correct me because you are entitled to have your name pronounced the way that it should be pronounced, so. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, you pronounced it correctly the, the second time. Okay. Um, my question is that, that um, walk-up song that you played, why did you choose that song? What does that song mean to you? So uh, one of the reasons why uh, I am really delighted by that song is I am an old school union man, right? So I am, uh, I was a worker side lawyer, um, I think that in uh, 11 years of practice, I think I represented three employers um, uh, in, a, in a practice that was dedicated almost entirely to labor and employment law. Um, so, so union songs are very important to me and um, uh, you know, sort of the, the power of these worker songs is that they are um, mechanisms for solidarity, right? They are ways for workers to uh, communicate their relationships with one another to one another and to management, right? Um, if, if an entire workforce is singing together, that sends a message about how they will respond to um, to efforts by management to divide them, um, and so that that's these are the types of things that I think are important. Is that they are um, is that they they're expressions of solidarity with one another, um, because as I said earlier, this is a world that's trying to grind you. And the only, the only way to prevent that is to do it together. So that's, that's what that song means to me. Okay. So Sally Ann, you're, you're next. Um, well, you basically answered my questions in <laughs> your introduction and everything else. It was really looking at um, your willingness to assist and facilitate students, whether with your course material or assignments and outside of the classroom facility. But based on things you have said, I gather that we can come to you when necessary. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I can't promise that I'm always going to be helpful, right? Because there may be questions that I can't answer um, or that I don't know the answer to, but I'm always, I'm always happy to pool my ignorance with you. Um, and I'm always going to, to play straight with you and say, look, I can't, I can't give you the answer to that. Um, so, um, but I'm, you know, if, if you're having problems with the course material, you're always welcome to, to come to me and ask for, for help and clarification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tyreek, you're, you're up. Good morning, sir. Um, I had one question, which was, given you're trained in the US, what was your transition like um, to teaching in the region? And if you have any difficulties with it? Well, uh, I don't know if you guys heard, but um, I apparently picked a fight with Samson Owusu last semester. Um, didn't, didn't know that was what I was doing, but apparently I, I did, and that, that was a thing. Uh, for a little while, um, uh, to, to sort of explain what, what happened, I, I come from an academic culture where 
criticism can be sharp. Uh, criticism of, of the work can be sharp, um, but uh, it's never interpreted as criticism of the person. Um, and uh, what I found is that in the Caribbean, the work can be uh, very strongly identified with the person to the point where criticism of one is considered to be criticism of the other. Um, I have found that uh, the things that are different in the law um, are relatively minor, but are things where I have to make sure that I'm, you know, I, I, I always want to make sure that I'm giving you guys accurate information that's based on the regional law and not sort of drawing on um, my training. Now, there, there were a couple of times last semester where students asked questions that sort of went beyond the scope of what I was prepared to teach. And I always said, and I'll say the same thing to you, if that happens, um, I, I'll say, you know, this is not what I'm prepared. So this is me sort of giving you the best answer I've got from, from my own training and experience, but you should not rely on this as being an authoritative statement of Caribbean law on, on this question. Um, so uh, I think, I, I, I hope that answers your question, Tyreek. Um, okay. Oh boy, I'm gonna butcher this one, this name. I apologize in advance. Ika, Ika, will yes, help. Ika. Ika. Yeah, it's Ika. Okay, go ahead. Um, the question that I asked in this survey was centered around what specific preferences you like um, students to employ when they are answering questions. So some teachers or some lecturers, they prefer you to have a set structure to answer questions. And if you deviate from that, then they wouldn't really mark your content. So I was just wondering if you are one of these lecturers. No, no that's, not, that's not how I operate. Um, so for, for future reference for, for all of you, this is getting a little close to how do I get an A in this class, but it's a fair question and, and I'll, I'll answer it. Um, but this is what I mean when I say don't ask, you know, the, you can ask anything except how do I get an A in the class is, um, but uh, I don't, my, my stance is that I'm not here to test you on formatting or form, I'm here to test you on the concepts. And so if you're communicating the concepts, I'm going to award marks. Um, the, the problem that you will run into is that if you do not, you know, the, the reason why your lecturers sort of encourage you to use form, uh, you know, set formatting or, or even require you to use set formatting is um, it makes marking easier if you know how the answer is going to be structured. Um, but for me, my stance is as long as your answer has organization so that I can tell what's going on, the concepts are, what's mat are what matters. I'm not really concerned about how you organize it. In fact, so one of the things that I will tell you guys is um, I'll tell you guys now, you are required to use OSCOLA as your citation method for any sources that you cite in any work you submit in this faculty. I do not award marks for proper OSCOLA citation, and I don't take them off for improper OSCOLA citation because I wasn't trained on OSCOLA. American lawyers use a different citation system. And so I don't know if you guys are doing it right or wrong. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna penalize or award marks over it, but I will tell you that it is required and you have to do it, okay? 
So uh, with that, moving on, uh, Caleb, you're up. Caleb Brathwaite. Hi, um, afternoon, sir. My question is, um, given that you um, have a political background as well as a legal background, um, sometime in the future, do um, you have any hopes to run for some high, high office or you just want to stick to um, law? Uh, well, being an American, I would have to go back to the United States if I were going to run for political office. Um, the long and the short of it is that I don't, I don't think I have a personality that is well suited to be the candidate. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of person that you hire uh, as, you know, that, that the candidate hires as uh, a, a high level staffer to sort of make sure that, um, that the candidate's policy priorities are being carried out. Um, but I am, so this is just sort of, since, since you asked, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I'll, I'll explain sort of why that is. Um, I have pretty severe social anxiety. And so like unstructured social interactions are actually very difficult for me. Um, and being a political candidate is basically nothing but unstructured social interactions. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's not that's not the kind of person that I am. So I don't really anticipate myself running for office. And also, I'm an academic, right? What I'm here to do is is research and and teaching. And uh, I'm not really a a hands on sort of politics person. Okay. So uh, Vincia or Vincia, um, you're you're next. And please. Yeah. please Tell me how to pronounce your name. You said it right the first time, Vincent. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, what did you enjoy least or most about studying law? Um, the the worst part of studying law was probably um, the uh the bait and switch of exams. So I had a couple of classes where professors said, oh, this topic that we covered in passing at the end of the semester will not appear on the final. You don't have to worry about it. And at American law schools, when I went through, 90% um, of, your, of your classes were comprised of you attend the lecture and then you take the final. And that's the, that's the final exam is the only opportunity you have to make your grade. So when the professor says, this is not on the final, you don't study it because you've got a lot of other things that you need to learn. Um, and then uh, of course, since I'm telling this story, you know that the punchline is that everything that a professor said was not on the final was in fact on the final. So that is that is one thing that I I really make an effort not to do as a lecturer um, because it drove me so it infuriated me so badly as a student is is don't uh, don't don't bait and switch the students um, in terms of what was the best part of law school who oh boy uh, well there was this semester where uh, about midway through my friends and I realized that we were going to the pub five nights a week. Um, that was a great semester. <laughs> uh, no, uh, probably the, the best part of law school was being able to um, spend some time really grappling with some ideas related to how the system ought to work above and beyond thinking about how it does in fact work, okay? So uh, Karima, you're, you're up, you're up. Try, trying to get through as many of you as I can. Uh, if, if we miss you, then um, we'll, we'll pick it back up next week before we start talking about the, the tutorial question. But Karima, you're up. Hi, morning. Um, my question was that 
How do you intend to make lectures entertaining, per se, like not just like? Well, I, I, I make no promises that they will be entertaining. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the purpose of this time is not to entertain, it's to learn. And so any entertainment is going to be uh, secondary to that. But, you know, I, I try and, uh, you know, keep it interesting. I try and, uh, you know, talk to you guys in a way that um, engages you and, um, you know, try and and make it so that at the end of at the end of the the lecture, you feel like your time has not been wasted. Um, you know, but but it's all secondary to the goal of making sure that you you understand the material. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, Kiandra, Kian, Kiandre, please please make sure. Please correct me. Yes, it's Kiandre. Good. Keandre. Yes. Keandre. Um, Go ahead. My question was basically answered already. <laughs> it happens, right? It happens. Uh, part of the reason why I say don't ask me how to get an A in this class is because last semester, easily a third of the class asked some <laughs> variation on that question. And it just, it, it drove me up the wall. Because like I said to one of your classmates, um, grading is just the worst part of, of, the class, and if it were up to me, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't do it. Um, but that's not how universities function. So, okay, um, I think I have a question. Um, great. Let me ask you. What? What? Um. What? Let's say method, maybe way. Would you propose is best for a student to balance the life of university and actually have a regular life, considering yeah. the um the workload that we have. Yeah, so work-life balance is, I mean, it's a problem in law generally. Um, one of the things that I would tell you is, you know, and, and I want to be clear, I do not, I do not live up to the things I'm about to tell you. I am terrible at work-life balance, um, but these are the things that I have been told, and they seem to work for the people who use them, right? Um, things like uh, scheduling not just the time that you will be in class, but the time that you'll spend studying, right? Treating being a student like a job where, you know, during the time that you're doing it, you're doing it. You're not doing other things. And then when you are finished, you walk away, right? So if you are a somebody who can devote 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. to being a student, then 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. you are a student, and from 4 p.m. to 9 a.m. you are doing other things. Um, you know, those, you know, those are, are the kinds of things that it, it really is about. I think it's really about just um, having the discipline to work when it's working time and not work when it's not working time. And that's, that's really the, the, the best secret I can come up with. Um, some things that may uh, help you sort of focus on work during working time would be, uh, I, will, um, I will put together a uh, list of a, a few techniques that I have, have read about, uh, and I will post them on, on e-learning um, for you uh, so that so that you have those to look at and sort of play around with, okay? So, uh, Caris, and, and let me know if I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, you pronounced it right. Uh, good morning. Uh, do you have a favorite success story? Do I have a, I'm sorry, a what? A favorite success story. Who? um... So let me give you a little bit of background. The United States has one of the uh, most worker-friendly wage and hour statutes in the world. It's 
probably the only worker-friendly employment statute in the United States at this point, but it is extremely worker-friendly. Um, when, when you are an employer side lawyer and your client gets sued for a wage and hour violation, um, the statute is so worker friendly that you go, you should be in risk management mode. You're not looking to win the case, you're looking to minimize the damage. That's how, that's how worker friendly the statute is. So in 2015, I represented an employer, one of the very few employers I ever represented in a wage and hour case in the Eastern District of Arkansas, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And we took the case all the way to trial because the client was not willing to, to settle for any amount that the plaintiff would accept. We took the case all the way to trial and won. Zero dollars for the plaintiff. Um, and that is, that is literally the only story that I know of, of any lawyer who does that kind of practice, who does wage and hour litigation in the United States, where um, a plaintiff walked away with nothing. I've never heard that story from any other lawyer. Um, so, uh, all right. Last question, uh, and then the, the other four of you that are here will get your questions answered uh, next week. So, Jewel, you're, you're up. Hi. Um, I think my question got answered when you were speaking because it was relating to um, teaching and what you thought about law. Okay. Okay. Well, then, uh, Christiane, your, ne your, your next last chance. Christiane, are you are you using the chat? Hi, sir. Good morning. Um, Good morning. My question would be: Do you think that there's like a, a limited number of hours, or or a set number of hours you should study in order to possibly get the highest number? I don't know if I worded that properly. Yeah. But. Well, okay, so what I, what I generally tell students is that um, for every hour of class time, um, you should anticipate spending somewhere between an hour to two hours prepping out of class. Um, so, so for a three credit course like this one, you should anticipate uh, six to nine hours a week being dedicated to this class between in class time and out of class time. So oh, okay. that's, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we are out of time, um, but I appreciate you guys uh, engagement and attention. And these, are, these were some really great questions. I appreciate those as well. And uh, I will see you guys uh, tomorrow in the lecture. <laughs> um Sir, before you go, I yes. noticed on the timetable there has actually been a change in our class times. I'm now okay. seeing that the class is as scheduled for Tuesday and Thursday, 2 to 3 p.m. I'm not sure if you're aware of that or maybe you could provide us with. I am not aware of that. Uh, I will reach out to the dean's office and find out what's going on and be in touch as soon as possible. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for bringing it to my attention. So, all right. Take care guys and I'll see you uh, at the next lecture whether that's today or tomorrow. Take care. Okay, take care.